uh, I'm Keenan. Maybe we'll get a few other folks trickling in. Since this is so nice and intimate, we can uh, be interactive if we want. Um, I've prob got probably kind of like a different lens, maybe, compared to a lot of the other talks that you've seen uh, here, if you've been to some other talks. Um, a lot of them are focused on you know, how to be contributors and, and use open source and achieve your goals, maybe inside of your job or at, at a big company. This is kind of a different angle, one, because we're focused on hardware, um, which is sort of uniquely different. Uh, and then two, it's on if you are interested in what it takes and sort of at least one person's journey in starting an open source nonprofit. Um, I think a nonprofit's a really good container that most open source projects that we want to steward for a long time kind of end up in. And so even if you're not interested in starting one, maybe it's useful um, to kind of look at what it takes and you probably interact with software that's written by nonprofits, aka the Linux Foundation as a not-for-profit organization. So. Um, I have a bunch of pictures, and so we're going to move super fast, uh, but I'll try to leave a lot of time for questions at the end, so let me know. Um, so where to start? Uh, Ribbit Network, um, I think, you know, kind of started from nothing, and I'll tell you a little bit about my background and maybe how I got into it. I've worked um, kind of you know, entirely in the hardware, like always been a big consumer of open source technology. So started off in aerospace, worked at SpaceX for a long time, founded a startup building electric aircraft, um, have run engineering teams and built a lot of other startups working on all kinds of robotics and submarines and aircraft and aerospace stuff. Um, and so I've got a really good technical background, understood open source, never really had a chance to kind of like give back uh, to it as much from those industries for various legal and uh, regulatory reasons. Um, I, you know, part of my pivot into climate, which is we're here for sustainability con, is kind of like the micro track. Um, I really have been passionate about climate for a long time. That's why I started the electric aircraft company. And after that company, I went and worked for a really big nonprofit called RMI. They're sort of like a think tank um, they like publish white papers, like pretty like norm core, like boring, uh, like you know, just traditional nonprofit stuff. And while I was there, I just I had a lot of time to think about climate. Um, and I think the more I thought about climate, the more interesting it was. Um, you know, out of if you pick all of our societal problems that we have, climate's really interesting because we know exactly what's causing it. Um, if you pick any other problem, like healthcare, housing, income disparity, like global conflict, most of the discourse is on like why is this happening. Uh, climate, that's not the discourse at all. We know exactly why it's happening, um, which is great. That's very convenient because that should make it easier to solve, right? Um, and it's, you know, before I get into the next slide, got this graph. The graph is going up. This is obviously a very simplistic representation, but we need to make that graph go down. Um, so I started thinking like, well, okay, that makes sense. Um, scientific method, right, is we should be measuring those greenhouse gases. Uh, are we doing that? Um, like, I'm not used to seeing measurements of greenhouse gases. Like, you might, like, temperature, humidity, or those kinds of things. And being at the big nonprofit, I got to kind of peek into the, the secret sauce about, like, how people figure out greenhouse gas emissions. And that might be a part of some of the work that you think about and do, especially if you're in sort of the cloud computing world. And the kind of like interesting answer is that we don't really measure it. Um, most of the greenhouse gas emission estimates that you see are sort of like derived values from something. So we kind of know like, okay, like a kilowatt of power in this region theoretically is kind of this emissions. And so that's kind of easy for power, but for other things like big companies, you end up with these like crazy spreadsheet models and people who have job titles like ESG and sustainability at big companies are spending a lot of their time doing this crazy modeling, um, which is great. Like that's what we should be doing. Uh, but like why, <laughs> like the next step is to try to augment that with some measured data, right? So if you imagine like, you know, I would like to see a future where we have kind of the weather radar style 
for greenhouse gas emissions. And that should be augmenting our data models so that when you know, a company is making a decision, or maybe it's your city council or policy, they should be making that decision based on measured data, um, but then also verifying that it works over time. Uh, and so we do kind of measure it a little bit. I was a little bit maybe extreme when I said we don't measure it at all. Just unfortunately, we have very few sites. So um, in the US, there's probably 20 sites that are measuring this. Um, that's it. Uh, this is like the most famous one. Um, and this is on the top of a mountain in Hawaii, which is great for sort of atmospheric science. Um, if you've seen like kind of the news about like increasing emissions, you're probably seeing data from this observatory. Um, unfortunately, it's not very useful for like, you know, it, it tells us there's a problem, but if you were a city council member and you're like, well, we got electric buses, did that work? Uh, <laughs> you, you don't really know because the measuring sites are way too far away from the emission sources for you to do anything useful because they end up being like on remote places like at the top of this volcano. Um, and so I started just talking to a lot of people about this and I was like, why are we doing this? Like, why do we not have a lot more low cost sensors? And there's this sort of like big kind of chicken and the egg problem of scientists are mostly driving the conversation today. They use very big, expensive and accurate sensors. This is a picture of kind of like what the inside of one of those monitoring stations might look like. These sensing stations are probably 500,000 to a million dollars a piece to kind of drop because they are the most accurate thing that you could possibly buy that are calibrated you know, every five minutes and are just not really designed to be mass scalable at all. Scientists want to use cheaper sensors, but they can't deploy enough to get enough data to validate that the models exist and create the use cases to say like why, like why should we have cheaper sensors and what are they useful for? And because scientists can't deploy enough sensors, um, companies and governments can't create business cases and monetary incentives around that because the scientists can't tell them why um, they're good for. And so governments don't have a use case because the scientists are unsure about the use case. And so, you know, logically you can look at it and be like, yes, we should have low cost sensors, um, but there's sort of no like capitalism incentive to make that happen right now, which is of course the inherent problem of climate, right? <laughs> and so that's sort of the idea that I got infatuated with, um, and which ultimately became a nonprofit. And I'll just talk you through kind of the journey of how I got there. So got excited about the problem. And like any good technologist, I was like, all right, like, let's just see if I can build that. <laughs> um, you know, bought a bunch of cheap sensors, kind of like wired it together, it looked bad. Um, started prototyping just to see what I could learn and like if I thought it was feasible to put together a sensor and what it takes to put one of these things outside. Um, these are just a bunch of fun pictures. I can kind of talk through the technology, but you can see it's like super rough and prototypey, right? Um, and I started talking to scientists about this and being like, hey, like, do you think that if we deployed a bunch of sensors through citizen scientists. Um, I had some experience with citizen science projects. If you've you know, ever worked on like the SETI project where you can download it on your computer and run analysis for different um, scientific missions or uh, folding at home is a great medical uh, process. Um, I was like, I think this model could work for low cost sensing. Um, we've seen it work for sensing other kinds of things like particulate matter Lots of people put particle matter sensors at their houses. Uh, could we do this for greenhouse gases? Um, and kind of the resounding answer I got was sort of yes. And then very quickly, I sort of ran into the limit of like, oh, well, I am just, I'm a decent engineer, but I need some help with this. And so I uh, you know, started talking to people about the project and what I wanted to do and started asking for help. Um, and pretty quickly, I was able to like kind of assemble a group of sort of friends and just people on the internet, right, who were kind of interested in that problem and started building more sensors, kind of giving them to people I knew, being like, 
all right, let's put this thing out there. Like, let's see uh, if it kind of works. Other people started building their own and started to form like a nice community around the problem. So you can see this is like a, oh, no, nope, not on the screen. Just like a fun video of kind of what maybe the earliest sensors kind of looked like. Um, and, you know, this is just buying whatever I could right off the shelf. Um, there's no like really like interesting kind of engineering to be done here, but it's just, you know, kind of proving out the concept and could it be done? And can we connect all these sensors up to a database where people can go get that data uh, to be useful? This is a very early sensor. So let me get back to my presentation. Cool, so it started building a lot of sensors. Um, started to look pretty good. At some point, um, there was kind of enough people asking for the sensors and I was buying enough parts. I was like, all right, so far this has been coming out of my like personal checking account. Uh, I think there's enough interest here in starting to buy sensors and hardware and 3D printers and things. Um, I, I, I would like this to be a thing. <laughs> Uh, that makes sense. And kind of because all the reasons I said before, um, I had talked to a lot of companies who had tried this, and I, I was pretty sure there was no like for profit business model that made sense. That would be the easier thing to do if there was the case, because I couldn't find a customer for this kind of thing. The people who are interested in the data are the science and government communities, but they don't have a budget to buy the data yet. Um, and also, they really want to be able to go inspect exactly how the data is, is put together. So open source made a lot of sense because I could go build the trust with the kind of consumers of the data, who's the science community. Um, and then open source as a nonprofit made even more sense, I thought. So uh, I was like, all right, I can imagine a future where Ribbit Network is going to allow society to identify open data and greenhouse gas emissions to drive effective and informed climate action and policies. So I started off on that mission. Uh, I am gonna kind of gloss over some of the legal stuff here, but like the short answer is you do a lot of paperwork, right? Uh, with the IRS, file a bunch of paperwork, you have to set up a board of directors, you wait a long time, you get a bank account and a website and stuff, and it's kind of pretty boring things. Um, this is my IRS letter. This is me getting it here. Uh, it's unfortunately very wet because someone in the US Postal Service, I don't know, left it outside in the rain. <laughs> um, that's how it came. And I think as I started to put together the kind of more interesting version of this, um, one of the things that I realized as well is one of the big benefits of being open source is we can provide excellent learning opportunities for people who are interested in hardware. Um, you know, we play a very small part in the total climate picture, and a lot of people um, need to build interesting hardware. So I, I thought the STEAM educational aspect could be very good as well. One of the big differences, if you're going to start a nonprofit, you know, the legal paperwork stuff is one thing. Let's put that aside. The, the main other difference is you have something called a theory of change. Um, this one's pretty hard to see. You can check it out on our website if you want. Uh, but it's how is the world going to be different based on your actions? How are you going to create the impact that you want? Because that's the currency that you trade in as a nonprofit, is like creating the impact. People give you money to create the impact, not for economic value return. And so we uh, kind of laid this out. That made sense. And then I started thinking, like, all right, got everything together right, kind of got a community of people. Um, I've got a general idea of what's happening. Uh, all I got to do, right, is lay out the plan. <laughs> and then I guess people show up and like give me money uh, to do it. I wasn't quite sure how that worked at this point, because I'm not an expert in nonprofits. So I laid out this big roadmap. Um, we were going to you know, finish the frog sensor to make it really scalable. We're going to validate the accuracy and calibration of our sensor. That's a big challenge in low-cost sensing. 
We're going to like figure out our funding strategy, like do all this stuff, like do science, I guess, <laughs> um, and start getting down here to kind of the impact portion of the study. Uh, I figured out pretty quickly, I was like, oh my, this is like way too big. I can't do all of these things. I got to have volunteers. I probably need some funding. I like need, you know, kind of more deployment locations. Um, I got to go start kind of attacking those problems more than like the technical problems of this device, which were kind of like the least interesting parts. Um, we'd been building, well, I guess I started building in public just because that felt nice. <laughs> um, it also is kind of one of the main ways that I attracted people who were interested in the project um, to kind of jump in. And so from day one, like all the instructions, the 3D files, the software were all on GitHub. Um, we continued doing that. Uh, and so a big part of my work early was to start decomposing that master plan into a bunch of like tactical tasks, right? And giving those out to people. And I think if you talk to any big open source maintainers, uh, they'll probably tell you that that's most of the work that they do is sort of like project management and coordinating like a bunch of people. Um, and was able to pull together a community of quite a few volunteers, which was awesome. Um, and we sort of really made a lot of technical progress, I think, and continue to do that to this day. So we'll talk a little bit. I'll just kind of breeze through. Like, this isn't really a technical talk, but we're all technical people-ish, probably. And so you might be somewhat interested. But this was like the very first versions of the sensor we had. Um, it's not like the most interesting piece of technology you've ever seen, but it was designed to be like easy to get, um, super cheap. Like we wanted to be able to, you know, if you had a 3D printer and access to SparkFun or Adafruit, you should be able to build this. So at a Raspberry Pi, we've got our three sensors up here, CO2 sensor, barometer, GPS, so we knew where it was. And that was working pretty well. Um, we had like a really dumb, cloud <laughs> uh, that was functional, but kind of made sense. So we kind of had all these frogs. Um, we used a really awesome piece of technology that I'll talk about in a second for fleet management. We pushed all the data to InfluxDB. Um, that ran a Python Flask app, kind of wrapped in Dash, which is an awesome sort of like web server slash visualization tool. And that ran on Heroku RIP. Um, we used this software called Bellina, which was awesome because we could run Docker containers on the edge. Um, so it made the code very accessible and sort of handled all the OTA and, and fleet management updates for us. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that was, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic. And then uh, if you know anything about what happened next, all of the Raspberry Pis stopped being available to buy ever. <laughs> um, so we're like, okay, got to redesign the sensor. Makes sense to redesign it anyway because we want to be lower power. The Raspberry Pi is not a great solution for power for a lot of reasons. So we spent the next like six months kind of going down to like this sensor that you see here. Um, it runs on a microcontroller, which is nice. It's an ESP32 S3. Um, kind of has all the same sensors. We made the enclosure a lot better. Um, we figured out how to 3D print this out of recycled plastic, which is nice. And we're very close to zero fasteners, which is awesome. So it sort of all clips together in, in a 3D printed way. And you can come check this out after. Or um, if you go to the showcase hall, the Goliath booth, they help us with fleet management now. And they have one of these, too, uh, that you can check out. Um, so yeah, we've designed this whole frog. It looks great. Again, all this code and CAD and everything is on the site. And we've got really good instructions that you can go check out if you want to build one yourself. Um, that's the ESP32. Pretty boring stuff there um, on the hardware side. But what's, I think, interesting is we run MicroPython on it, which helps us achieve sort of our STEAM learning goals. It's probably not the language that you would use maybe in your day job potentially on, on a board like this, but it's very accessible um, to maybe high school or college students who are sort of, maybe they know Python, but they're, 
They're trying to get into some hardware, maybe robotics fields, and MicroPython is a great sort of stepping stone for them. Um, this is the sensor right here. Um, it's what's called a near-infrared dispersion sensor. So it has two kind of tiny infrared emitters um, which shoot out and kind of diffract gas through a diffraction screen. And there's a sensor that picks it up and tells you what the concentration of CO2 is. Uh, that's the barometer up there. And a GPS sensor to just tell us both location, but then also, more importantly, altitude very accurately, because we need to know at what altitude the sensor is. Um, and then our cloud got like a little bit more complicated because the fleet management for microcontrollers is much more difficult um, than it was. We can't run Docker on the MCUs anymore. So we partnered with Goliath. They're awesome as a fleet management service. If you ever need to use them for microcontrollers, can't recommend it enough. So we've got kind of this mixed cloud now where like, here's our V4 frogs. They push it over CoAP, which is a kind of funky protocol. If you ever need like a really low power protocol over cellular, our frogs are mixed. We've got like some Wi-Fi, and then we have a cellular hat that kind of goes on the frog if you need to do cellular. And so CoAP is really good for the cellular connection. Um, again, all the data kind of like runs through some serverless functions, ends up in InfluxDB. We still host a Dash app. Uh, now on platform.sh, which is great if you're looking for like a CO2 conscious hosting platform. And it ends up in this awesome web page, which you can go look at and like look at all the data from your frog. So uh, that's kind of the technical rundown. We'll shift like back to organizational stuff a little bit. So if we we kind of left off, like I had like assembled this group of volunteers and we had all these big goals and kind of like no money to go do it because we we're like, oh man, like <laughs> we really need to put a lot more sensors out here. We want to be doing more events. Um, this was kind of all running out of my like small desk at home. I was working from home, and so like I just had a limited amount of space to do things. Um, and then we got really lucky uh, because I had been so public and I had been, you know, kind of talking on the internet about this a little bit and just with whoever I would want to talk to it about. Um, this company came to me and they're like, hey, we're a really big company. Like, could we build sensors as like a corporate event? And I was like, I don't know. I guess you could do that. Like, I guess that aligns with kind of our goals. Um, and they were like, whatever it costs, like as long as it's sort of reasonable, we can do that. And I was like, great, um, let's do it. So they were like, let's build 150 sensors. I, I think we had probably deployed like maybe 50 <laughs> uh, at kind of this point. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do that, <laughs> uh, like physically build enough sensors. But I was like, I will try. So tried to build as many sensors as I could. Um, <laughs> it was a, a really scrappy, like fun kind of two months uh, for me. <laughs> I think it, it sort of really dominated my living space and kitchen. Uh, here in Seattle, which uh, I live in Seattle, so welcome if you're from out of town. Um, but it was a great event, so we ended up kind of in a conference just like this, 160 corporate executives of a big publicly traded company building this thing. And that was sort of the lucky break, I think, for us in funding, because that kind of like kicked us over the hill in terms of like, okay, now we've got a little bit of cash, we've gotten a lot of exposure, we were able to start winning some grants from that company's foundation at that point. And so kind of money and finances is, um, you know, we're not rich, like I'm still a volunteer, I'm not paying myself, but uh, it's not the number one dominant thing that we think about. And that let us kind of really focus on the impact side. So we were like, okay, we've got a little bit of money, we can start sort of donating some sensor kits to universities. So undergraduate university programs are starting to be really popular for us. Uh, we ran our first one with Rutgers last summer. I think we'll do that again with them this summer, um, hoping to do it with a lot more universities. They were able to build frog kits and sort of start thinking like a scientist of like, if I put this thing here, what am I going to see? <laughs> uh, am I going to see what I want? And I think that experiential learning process, especially for hardware, is, is super important because they're for the most part not getting that in their academic program. 
uh, generally, I would say, or they're probably were way undersubscribed in most university programs. Um, we were able to start creating, you know, most of this is all community driven still, right? So people started creating educational modules. So if you're a K through 12 teacher, you want to do this as an after school program, kind of like you need to have some like documents and modules to kind of like guide you through it. And we started to put together some of those, which are, are really helpful in just explaining like, what is the carbon cycle? <laughs> uh, what is CO2? Um, why do we think about it? And it's just like a nice, I think, uh, sort of tangible on-ramp for a lot of people as they think about climate or steam or some of the hard things that we have to think about. Uh, we were also able to put together a great science advisory board. So that was kind of the reason I got into it, right, was, you know, I'm totally down for the educational side, but I was like, let's create impact. <laughs> and so I knew we had to get the science community on board. Um, we've got some great science advisors from NASA and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab who are helping us sort of evaluate the performance of the sensors, try to figure out what our strategy is for defining the use cases and how we build trust in that community uh, as we deploy an ever-growing fleet of sensors. Um, we started to put some sensors at cool places. So I mentioned, you know, there's probably 20 or 30 of these really expensive sensors. So one of the best experiments that we can run is starting to put our sensors next to those big expensive ones. So this is our frog. This is in Wind River, Oregon, uh, which is like way out in the middle of nowhere, Oregon. Um, but there's a great tower here, which used to be an old crane. And they have CO2 measurements like every 10 meters or so up these towers. And so we've got four or five frogs on the tower. And what th that lets us do is we can compare the measurements to those frogs. Um, and that's really useful data. So this is me climbing the tower, super scary. Uh, <laughs> They were like, do you want to climb up it? Here's a waiver, um, and here you go. Uh, we've started to do more corporate events, which I think right now is our sort of primary vector of funding, which is always like, you know, we're not in it for the money, but we need money to create the impact. So like, what's the funding story? Um, these are great. Uh, we've done a lot of them with, you know, corporates who maybe donate the sensors to a local school or a local boys and girls club or some organization who can go cite the sensors in their community or they do it with their employees or whatever. Anybody is welcome. Um, so that kind of, you know, leads us to today. Um, we've been able to win enough grants and funding. We've got a small office, which is yay. Uh, we've graduated out of my kitchen, <laughs> um, which is nice. Um, that's here in Seattle. And what that has allowed us to do is we now can keep enough stock and inventory where you can go on our website and you can buy a kit if you want, which is a big step for us because before it was always able to, you know, you could build a sensor if you wanted, but you had to be able to navigate like, can I buy stuff from SparkFun and DigiKey? And like, that's fine. Um, it's not necessarily hard, but it's maybe like, you have to do a few steps and if we can get to the one button click to like start having an experience, that's great. Um, and that has really opened us up to even more educational events. So one of the problems, if you don't know, about deploying hardware into schools is most schools can't buy things unless they're from a registered vendor. And most tech people, organizations, don't want to do the paperwork to do that. <laughs> uh, so like most schools can't buy from Adafruit, for example, because for some reason they refuse to do the paperwork, I guess. Um, probably because they're a for-profit company and this is always small fish for them. So we've been able to be the organization that can procure the parts for them, do their paperwork, get them the stuff they need, um, and it's a good partnership all around, I think. We're also starting to make, you know, again, really exciting progress on the sensor side. So I showed you the sensors in Oregon. Um, those are administered by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, we also have sensors in Zurich, which are starting to produce some really interesting data sets. And with the help of some awesome community volunteers, we're starting to like really dig in in an open source manner to like, how good are these sensors? Like, let's go way beyond what the data sheet says, because the manufacturer 
you know, they're, they're like, yeah, the sensor is great. Like, <laughs> uh, it's perfect. And so, like, is that true? Um, and in, in what scenarios and what use cases is that true? And this is exactly the kind of work that we're starting to go out and, you know, pitch for grants and stuff with the national labs to, like, build up these data sets and build up models for how to interpret this data. So uh, that's kind of the story, which leads us to today. Uh, you know, like I said, this isn't exactly a guidebook, but it's just sort of my experience building a nonprofit. If that's something that's interesting to you, or um, you ever want to think about it, or just what it's like being on the inside, um, it's been about you know coming up on three years, and um, yeah, I love it. So, thanks. Uh, any questions? Happy to take them. I think we've got a few minutes. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly, that's a great example of the kind of question the scientists don't know yet. Um, so they know kind of like, okay, we need a lot of sensors. How many is too many? Uh, they need to sort of build up the data models to say like, um, one of the big questions is like, what's the crosstalk between the sensors in different wind conditions? That's probably different in a city where there's like tall buildings versus like a field versus like a neighborhood with houses and start starting to like develop those models um, is is at the cutting edge of atmospheric science today. And so it's difficult to say without starting to have the data to prove that. So um, I don't know what the answer is. Like we only have a few reference experiments to look at. One is um, in Munich. They put down five sensors in Munich and they were like, well, this is not dense enough really. Uh, and in Berkeley, they put down 30, and they were like, it should be a lot more, but we don't have the money to do it because their sensors were 250K a piece. So I, I think it's, um, you know, our sensors right now are probably somewhere in the order of $150. Um, that's less than the cost of a streetlight bulb for most of your city municipalities uh, because there's a really long duration like high voltage bulbs, I think it's not unreasonable to be at that density if we look forward, you know, 50 years in the future. Um, yeah, I think there's probably like 50 that are online at any given time. It kind of comes and goes, and like that's a lot of the engineering work that the community kind of does of like, oh, like, if somebody's sensor goes offline, like how can we figure out a way to notify them <laughs> uh, that it's offline? So we probably have like somewhere between 25 to 50 that are online at any given time. Um, we've probably deployed close to 600 sensors and um, I hope to do more <laughs> uh, in the future. So I think if you're interested in deploying a sensor, we would love to have you build one. Um, also, if you're interested in helping us solve a lot of the sort of engineering and technology challenges, especially around software. Um, those are very much open. And we'd love to have you come join in the community. Uh, black shirt. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, um, so Zorian's mentioned this, is it sold as a kit? Or um, is it sold as a kit? Um, so, you know, most of the fun, I think, <laughs> is in building it. Uh, so this one's pre-assembled, but, you know, it's all a part. Uh, but the main benefit is you don't have to go find all the parts. They just show up and you put it together. That has the added benefit of, if you remember back in my roadmap slide, I was like, ah, oh, FCC certification, that's the thing we have to do. You just don't have to do that if you sell it as a kit, which is nice. <laughs> Um, from our perspective, because that's a big money savings and time. So, uh, yeah, blue, blue. Yeah, uh, curious if you thought about uh, maybe this is the SEC problem, but linking it to other consumer or retail products in, in similar space, whether it's you know, like the uh, temperature and uh, articulate sensor. Mm -hmm. Sure.
sure. Yeah, I think the ultimate goal and one of the reasons why we're a nonprofit and publish open hardware is we want people to pick up the learnings and go integrate those into other products. Um, it's, it's tough for us to make the case of like, hey, put this thing in your product <laughs> or give us your data um, and, and we'll host it on the internet for free. <laughs> Most for-profit companies are not so down for that, but I mean, um, we would love to sort of be the data steward and help keep data in the public domain for other hardware vendors because if we really want to get to the scale that I'm talking about, um, we know what models work for scaling hardware deployment. Um, like Raspberry Pi is a great example of that. They're a split nonprofit and for profit. Um, the nonprofit hosts the designs and sort of IP, and the for profit scales the hardware. And so I think we would love to work with a consortium of hardware for profits in the future. Um, so, yeah. If anybody has ideas or collaborations they want to talk about, we're all ears. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I like honestly, if I look back on it, I think, and I think that's why it's really important to put it in the story. Is like um, most open source projects, especially nonprofits came up through some absurd break. Like most people didn't sit down and write down their exact plan for how they got to success. Um, and so if you are in a position where you can make that happen for an organization that you care about, um, it can really matter <laughs> uh, because it's totally serendipitous. And I think we always hear about kind of insane scenarios that led to success, but we don't hear about as the 50 others that people just burned out and ran the project into the ground because uh, it never made success. I mean, uh, well, I like to think that we put ourselves in the position where I could have just persisted and maybe the next break would have come, but honestly, I don't know. So, <laughs> and, and I think that's a good, you know, we all use open source projects. Um, a lot of those are, are part of nonprofits and um, you know, little, maybe little donations to you can actually be a pretty big factor for the people kind of maintaining them. Yes. Yeah, great question. Um, right now, we plug it into the wall. <laughs> it's USB-C. That's not great um, because it's outside. So one, you need to have an outlet to the number one reason sensors go offline, kind of to the other question, is like a GFI trips or the wind blows the plug out or something. So our kind of next big push on the hardware side is to get to a solar powered version of this. Um, we think that if we do a good job on the solar power side, it's gonna be all self-contained, right? And so that lets you put it in way more places, um, but I think we'll eliminate probably the biggest Number one reason why the sensors go offline. Yeah, there. It's one of the tough things because every scientist has sort of a different angle of like, oh, I'm really interested in this research question. Uh, what we know is like we want to be around high emissions sources, so roads, factories, urban environments generally are better than like non-urban environments, just because those are, are where emission sources are. Um, you know, I, I showed you that tower. A lot of scientists are really interested in sort of the mixing vertically of CO2, so what happens when you emit CO2 out of your car is it comes out and as it goes up, generally, it kind of mixes with the atmosphere. And we have very little understanding of like, how quickly does it mix in different scenarios? Um, and so that's like a big research question that a lot of people are really interested in. Um, other people are very interested in sort of like the environmental justice uh, aspect of it. So. Um, like CO2 doesn't have a ton of human health factors, 
but other sort of greenhouse gases, which hopefully we'll have, right now we just measure CO2, but hopefully we'll do other gases in the future. Um, you can start linking those to other sort of like indicators and things that might have human health factors, which is very important for environmental justice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's exactly one of the other big science questions is like, as we try to develop these models, we know these sensors are less accurate um, than kind of like the big lab sensors, right? How much less and in what scenarios uh, is it? And if you're a sensing person, there's all kinds of different like vectors that the sensors can be wrong or right. They can be precise or they can be accurate or they can drift over time or they can, that can all change in different thermal or pressure conditions. And so kind of like building the model that can calibrate all that out and having a good understanding of the sensor is sort of the core like concept and, and hard thing that we're doing. Um, and then the other hard thing is like, if we look to the future, we'll probably have more than one type of sensor. And so how do we start developing multiple of those models for maybe different brands or, or, or gases of sensing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I think this might have to be the last question because we got to like get ready for the next speaker. But um, we've done a few lab tests thanks to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They've helped us. You know, you put the sensor inside of a pure gas that you know the concentration of, so you can buy reference CO two gas that's like five hundred ppm. You just put the sensor in there and like you can start to detect the drift of the sensor over time. And so we've got a, a decent estimate of that now for our current sensing. Um, what's harder to do is this thing called automatic baseline calibration. So we know all sensors drift over their lifetime. And sort of the industry way that this is solved is you just bring the sensors back once a year, calibrate them in the reference gas. We would prefer not to do that, uh, just because that's probably the number one cost driver of the sensor. And so trying to figure out some smarter ways to do that. So we kind of imagine there's like an area where like we can site a few very high precision sensors in a city and use them to calibrate out the rest of the sensors in some clever ways. And by you know kind of doing the experiments in Zurich and Oregon, we've started to kind of understand what the relation between a few low cost sensors and one high cost, high accuracy sensor might be. Um, and we're learning a ton, but we're still learning. Okay, uh, cool, I think I'm at time. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. I uh, hope this was interesting and informative. Uh, get in touch with me, I think I'm easy to find on the internet if you ever wanna collaborate or talk about this more, so thanks.